Hola, Ms. Moreno. Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for doing this. Um, it's important for me to start with a thank you because um, you are my possibility model um, and you have been a possibility model for three generations of my family. Wow. So I, as long as I've been an actor and I've met some people and I've told my mom or my dad or some family about it, the only person that they've ever been extremely excited about was you. And for me, hearing about you um, throughout my childhood, and Lynn says this very beautifully, Lynn Manuel says this really beautifully in the movie, which we'll get to. He says, um, you know, whenever any of us uh, thought about what was possible for us and if we could ever make it, for generations, there was you on the moon to look to. Wow. And that's who you were to, uh, to us. And after watching the movie um, three times now, um, what moves me the most Start is- Start calling it a documentary. Yes, yeah, so the documentary um, is that while we were holding you up, you were trying to survive. And I just, was hanging by my nails. Yes. Yes. And the movie really, the, the documentary really um, helps us understand what your path was. Um, and more than anything, I want you to tell us why you wanted to tell this story right now, why you wanted us to hear all of this now. Because I'm sure people have asked you before to do a documentary. Uh, first of all, it, it wasn't my idea. So it wasn't like I went to somebody and said, you know, I think I should do a documentary on my life. But Norman Lear and Brent Miller, his business partner, uh, Brent came to me actually and said, you know, I, I'd love to do a documentary of you. And honestly, I was surprised. No, I had not been asked before. Mm. And, uh, and I said, why? And he told me it's something kind of similar to what you just very sweetly said. And uh, he said, you know, you, you, you were the icon for many, many years of a lot of Hispanic people. And he says, I don't doubt, I'm putting words in his mouth, but he said more or less, uh, I don't think people realize how hard it's been. Because he said, you exude such positive uh, emanations that uh, people don't think of you as someone who's had to struggle, who's had her heart broken, who's been disappointed and a lot of it having to do with your nationality. So you were gonna so, say something, yeah. No, well, I, you know, that was what was really interesting to me also in, the, in the, the documentary goes into great lengths about how growing up in New York City and you got to New York at, how, at what age? I was uh, just under five, I was four and a half, five. five. Around four, and by the time you were 16, you were the sole breadwinner of your household. But it was at a time when there was overt racism and overt misogyny um, and little opportunity for anyone like you. So can you talk a little about how you, how, how New York and that life treated you? What it, I think, what it for you? I think, well, New York, I think, uh, New York and show business, because show business, as you know, is a very, very cruel profession. It can break your heart. It's, it specializes in that, I think. Uh, New York, on the other hand, also toughens you. But it depends on your character. I think a great deal has to do with my character, with the, the, the DNA that I grew up with. Um, uh, I've always been a person who just kept moving. And uh, not because I'm particularly bright or uh, enterprising, it's just a part of who I am. And I remember that when I was writing my book about my life, I was gonna call it Keep Moving. Mm. Um, I was treated very badly in, in New York City. I came to New York when I was five years old. I came with my mother by ship who could afford airplanes? 
in those days. Carabobo. ¿En qué? Carabobo. Yes, the ship was called the SS Carabobo, which literally translated means the SS Stupid Face. Yes, I've been called car uh, Cara de Bobo many times. <laughs> It's such a crazy name. I found out, by the way, you will you will want to know this, that that was the name of a very respected and famous uh, soldier. Really? Yes. He was something like a general, something Carabobo. <laughs> Don't tell me he didn't have troubles with that name. Well, what's what's interesting too to me is that you know you talk about you say in the in the documentary that your mother wanted to take you to New York for a better life. Right. And then what you found was an inverted Oz. That's exactly right. I, I went from paradise to, uh, uh, I wouldn't even, I would call it hell, a kind of hell. Uh, a place where, number one, you have to speak another language. It didn't. was a real shocker and difficult for me because my mom just literally, when I was five, threw me into kindergarten in public school. I didn't know a word of English. Can you imagine that? No. Can I think of it now? You know who taught me English? I, what? You know who taught me English? You did. On uh, the, the electric, electric company? company? Yes. Oh, that great show for children. So I can't, yeah. you, no, I can't imagine, but I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to. No, that's that. okay. Anyway, uh, I came to this country from a paradise because I had a lovely childhood and immediately started to freeze. And I got on the bus uh, from, uh, where is it that you land, where boats? Uh, yes. Yes. And, uh, we and got this is bus. 1930s, depression era, New York City, segregation is, right. you know, oh. Jim Crow. Taken for granted. I mean, just everybody kind of accepted that. Yeah. But I got on a bus and froze to death. And I said to my mother, what? is this and then i looked at the trees and i said what happened to the trees mm. and she said uh it's called winter honey because <laughs> what happened to the trees because all my young life i'd seen nothing but green and right. red and pink and yellow and it was it was really a paradise yeah. and uh it was not an auspicious beginning because when I went to kindergarten, my mother took me and the kids were playing on the roof garden of this public school. And uh, I was very shy. I didn't speak the language, I didn't speak a word. And she said, well, I have to go now. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, don't worry, I'll come back. She says, I'm gonna get you some chicle gum. I'll get you some chicle and I'll come back. So the teacher at a certain point obviously said, okay, kids, it's time to go back in. And uh, she came to me and I remember saying to her in Spanish, no, mi mami fue pa' chi chicle. Estoy aquí, voy a esperar la aquí. I'm gonna wait for her here. Oh, no. She went for some chicle, some gum for me. And she obviously said in English, no dear, <laughs> we're going back to the classroom. I didn't know what she was saying. And she literally had to bodily pick me up crying my eyes out, not knowing where I was even being taken. Right. It was a dreadful experience. And it's, then, you know, that was one of many. Yeah, you know, you say in, in the documentary that, um, that it's a sickness to not understand your value, that it's an illness that you, um, you suffered with for many years. Um, many, many years. I grew up thinking that I had no value whatsoever because I was indoctrinated to that. Uh, when I started to go to school, which was kindergarten, uh, which I just described, um, I learned that I had to go to school and home another way because these little gangs of kids, would, they wouldn't hurt me, but they would say terrible words. And literally that's where I learned the word spick. Mm -hmm. And that's why I learned things like garlic mouth and stuff like that. Garlic and mouth. I didn't tell my mommy because I, I just instinctively knew that she couldn't do anything about it. Well, you know, you say this many times in the documentary that 
these various things happen and you were living under these certain circumstances, but there was no one to go to, to report. You couldn't, you know, you wouldn't be taken seriously anywhere, basically. Right. So you had to find a way to just. So what you do is you, you hear those terrible words and you cry and you uh, stop crying and you learn to live with it, but it's, it's unhealthy. It's not good for you because what happens, children are very tender creatures, no matter how tough and raucous they are, they're very, very tender and naive. And if someone says you're not, you don't have value, you believe it. The thing yeah. is, you don't know why you don't have value and why certain people don't like you, but you take that for a fact. But then something happened pretty early on that happened to me, which was you started to find value in how people responded to you, to your dancing, performing. to performing. your performing. <clears throat> and and yeah. so that was, um, to me, I, I kept, I, I saw so much of myself in that, of needing um, approval. That's why we did the documentary. Right. You of say, I see value. so much of myself in that. Oh, there's and so much that I- Precisely, I, really what was behind the, the objective was to, not just uh, Hispanic kids, but black kids, Chinese kids, American Indian kids. That's what it was really meant for in a way. Yeah, and one of the most heartbreaking things um, for me to hear in the film, in the movie was that you learned how to hate being Hispanic because you understood how people saw you um, or, you know, and how people thought of you. Um, and then to go into an industry that had no idea of what to do with you. They, they couldn't, there were no roles for you because they couldn't see you at all. So they would stick you in these roles that had nothing to do with your experience or your race or, and- um, American and Indian girls, hard. Egyptian girls, Hawaiian girls, Egyptian, everything but. Yeah. Because and you know, here's, here's you. the thing, you know, what always amazes me too is that uh, in my family, we are many colors, mm -hmm. many. I have an aunt who is quite dark, Lydia mm -hmm. and Lydia, Titi. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there were people like me in my family who really took after my grandmother who was a Spaniard and mm -hmm. she was very fair because she was a Spaniard. Actually, even Spaniards also have dark skin very often. But um, it was very confusing to me. It, it really. was for me They were too. always putting dark makeup on me. Yeah. Is that crazy? Yeah, the color of mud, you said. That's what you called it. The In West Side Story. It was, the, oh, I remember there's one shot of George Chakiris at the, near the beginning of the movie where they show him against a red wall. He's so gorgeous. And he looks like he was dipped in a bucket of mud. I mean, he was so dark that it didn't look like anybody's dark. Right. And that's, that's the makeup they used on all of the Puerto Ricans, so-called Puerto Ricans in, in that movie. And I, you know, for me, because I had, I had a similar issue in the sense that um, I kept being asked to play these, um, you know, young, effeminate, um, over the top characters, right? Um, that really had nothing to do- Why with effeminate? Well, because that's what that's all that there was at the time, right? That if you were going to play a gay part, that you know that's what the what it was. And since I started my career playing this gay um, character, that's uh -huh. all I ever got. So I I saw you doing something that I got accustomed to doing, which was well, if I'm going to play these roles, um, I'm going to find some humanity in them, right? I'm going to find right. some some you know something to latch onto that I can bring to this. this exactly. Because you, were, you had to take those parts. You talk about that. You had to make a living. I, you know, people forget. Because uh, when I speak to high school students, the first thing they say is, well, why'd you do it? Right. Right? And, uh, and I, I surprise them and I shock them. I said, I had to eat. I had to help pay the rent. I needed health insurance. I had, in, uh, 
I had to have insurance. I had to, I had to go to the cleaners and have stuff cleaned. That costs money. Yeah. You pay for those services. It's and, interesting uh, because people assume because you were in West Side Story, which we'll get to in a minute, that you were this, you know, this millionaire, right? You know, everybody was like, what could she right. want? And then you didn't work. Oh, for after I won the awards, which was the uh, Golden Globe and uh, the Oscar, I didn't do a film again for seven years because I was turning down lesser versions of gang movies right and uh, once in a while something would come so i did a lot of um uh, summer theater and uh i was able to do some television but even then i was playing I, they were still doing westerns and uh guess who i was La lolita conchita you know the feather too right oh man and then the american indian girl yes oh that was I mean, that's really offensive. There, there is, there's a scene in, from one of those movies where you find out that he's giving you up for another white girl and yes. you lose your mind and throw yourself off of a cliff. That's right, that's right. Only to be bitten by stingrays once you got that down. Well, what happened was that uh, the, the, the continuation of that scene when you see her ostensibly fall off a cliff right. uh, is you cut to the scene at the beach where she's supposed to have landed. And uh, the director kept telling me to stop jumping around. And I kept saying the, the uh, ocean was filled with thousands, hundreds of thousands of tiny jellyfish. jellyfish. Luckily they, they, they stung, but they were tiny ones. Still. And the director says, keep still, you're supposed to be dead. And I said, I'm sorry, but there's a lot of jellyfish that's stinging me. He says, do as I say. And here's the other thing people don't understand is it's not like you could get on the phone and call your union at the time. There was no union, right? There was an agent, but you can you see my agent saying, do as he says, right? Right. No. So again, so which brings me to um, Anita, who is who means so much to all of us, right? Um, my mom was my mom and her sisters were those girls in Spanish Harlem and, and in Brooklyn who had the windows open when the Oscars were on and it, you could hear them screaming through the windows when you won. Um, and sh that character, her strength, um, really meant a lot to so many of us for generations. But what moves me is that you say that she was a role model for you. Absolutely. I had never played, I had never played a role where I was a Hispanic girl or woman who had a sense of herself, who had self-respect, who had a sense of dignity. I had never played a part like that. Can you believe it? Yes, actually. That's what's sad. Is that yeah. Believe it. Hmm. Um, I'm, I'm experiencing something similarly now, which is I play this doctor in the 32nd century um, yeah. spaceship. And I feel freed from all of the racism and homophobia and all of this that, you know, he gets to be all of who he wants to be without any of those barriers. And so I, when you, when you said that in the movie, in the documentary, I completely understood what that meant. It's yeah. empowering to be able to be allowed to be all of that, to be all of the things we know we're To be of. all that you can be. Right. Yes, right. Um, so I think this is where I want to talk about Marlon. Sure. <laughs> Mainly because I think that um, you, you understand that he was put in your life to work out some stuff. I guess. Um, I guess, right? There were some lessons there. Oh um, boy. Self-worth, right? Absolutely, you hit that on the head. Yes, he was a man who uh, <clears throat> had to be, <clears throat> excuse me, had to be in control. And uh, that was okay with me because most of my life, I sought men who were in charge. 
And here's the thing, and I think I mentioned this in the, in the documentary, uh, many of us join each other, men and women, men and men, women and women, with the same objectives. In my case, it was, you be the daddy, I'll be the little girl, and you take care of me. That's what actually happened in my marriage, unfortunately. But uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, we were married 46 years. But with Marlon, uh, here was the king. Yes. The king of just about everything, of sex, of movies, of anything you can think of. And it was uh, undoubtedly- he was, the, he was the mountaintop. Too. Oh, he really he was. Yeah. He was the mountaintop. He was a star. Mm -hmm. He had enormous cachet. And uh, don't think for a moment that that isn't what I wasn't, I was after that. I mean, if I had, if someone had asked me then I would never have admitted it. Right. But the truth is that his, his persona is what turned me on. Aside from the fact that he was a, a turn on, he was a very sexy man. Yes. He was a very, and we had quite, um, quite uh, our life together. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was tumultuous. It was tumultuous. It was insanely sexy. It was, I wouldn't trade it really in a way because that never happened again with anybody. That right. particular I was ask, kind of intensity. Ever, did you ever get to speak to him after you guys broke off before yeah. or you know, later in his life? We became friends, mm. telephone friends mostly because. Um, I didn't think it was a good idea for him to be coming to my house with my husband and my daughter and stuff. And my husband knew that I would, I would talk to him on the phone. And in fact, he talked to Marlon on the phone a couple of times. Uh, but he truly loved me because as my therapist said at the time, Ben, you have earned a degree in Marlonology. He says, nobody knows that man the way you know that man. And that was my job. I had to, because I had to be ready for any kind of onslaught. Right. I had to be ready. So really, if, if there was a, a picture of what was really going on, on inside me whenever I was with him, it should be a picture of me going. What's next? What's coming? He, yes, yeah. exactly. Um, and, but he, uh, he did I admired his intelligence because that's something I've always admired in men. Right, but he, brought you to, he, he kind of brought you to activism, right? He helped you find your voice as an activist. Uh, that, no, not really. No, no. I, I had a roommate, a girlfriend who did that. Ah, she, was, uh, she, she, was a, uh, she was a retired communist. <laughs> she was no longer one, but I didn't even know that. But uh, I met her in group therapy. Mm. And she was a terrific, terrific woman. And she's the one who really got me interested. He, Marlon is the one, which is kind of funny, the one who said, you need therapy to me. Right, right. You know, the loony is telling the other loony, you need therapy. I, I when, they, when he says, when you say it in the, in the documentary, I heard it as, you're gonna need therapy to get through this relationship with me. <laughs> no, oh, no, no, he wasn't that thoughtful at all. No. No, 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 no. He was the funniest man, person I have ever known. I believe that. He could, I, I would be on the floor laughing so hard. His sense of humor was divine. And he had a great vocabulary. And you know, a great vocabulary goes a long way for many, many things. People yeah. don't realize that. What did it feel like to be, um, so visible and vocal during that time, during that civil rights moment, in March on Washington. What was, were you aware? Well, I, of had, I had become active uh, before that, but it was, uh, I'll tell you this, for some reason, I never fully, fully understood what an extraordinary time that was. I mean, I knew it was important, obviously. And uh, I, I had been active to that point. And uh, Harry Belafonte wanted a Hollywood contingent there because <clears throat> I'm guessing, but he wanted 
Martin Luther King to understand that there were people in Hollywood who were good people. It wasn't mm -hmm. all just false lashes and, and uh, heavy makeup. And, um, but as the years have gone by, <laughs> I've really awakened to the monumentalness, for lack of a better word, of that experience in my life. I mean, I still get goosebumps when I think about it. Oh, well, I'm, I have no doubt. Um, I do wonder, um, because you also, we also see you in the, in the documentary um, watching the Kavanaugh hearings. Um, oh, yes. Testimony. Yelling at the screen. Right, which we all, which we all were, I was screaming. I at always the yell at the screen. Um, but I wonder, you know, having been through um, a civil rights movement and a, um, uh, the ERA, the pa you know, trying to pass the ERA and the e women's rights movement that, you know, all these years later that, did you think we would be further along in terms of those issues than we are now? I sure did. When we did the March on Washington, I, first of all, it's, it's impossible to describe the thrill of having experienced that, being there. You know, that beautiful pool that you saw in the inauguration uh, yeah, the festivities was jammed with humanity, jammed with people wearing overalls, people who walked, people who took bus. I mean, you just, I really get such goosebumps. Um, so I really thought things were gonna just, just like that, yeah. very unrealistic. And uh, it was shocking. And I remember being at a number of rallies where they were, J. Edgar Hoover had sent cameras to take pictures of people who were partaking. And I remember being so shocked at that and getting scared because yeah. I thought maybe I'll never work again. You know, uh, many of us went to that, uh, who were in my business, uh, who went to that event, were scared to death we'd never work again. Jim Garner, Jim, James Garner had an ulcer. Mm. And all the way in the airplane on the way to Washington, D.C., he was guzzling Pepto-Bismol because his, he was terrified <laughs> that uh, not, not only would he not have a, a career left, but that people would hate him and they'd start saying terrible things about. But here's the thing about James Garner, he went. Right. So I truly, truly, truly am filled with admiration because he was more frightened than anybody there, more oh, than that. People forget that you were putting your livelihood yes. on the line at the time, yeah. with your lives, with your physical lives. You know, they just, they see you there and they say, oh, isn't she feisty? Right. Wow. And you know, that's the one thing that I think, uh, we put an end to it in the uh, documentary. Feisty, yes, but terrified half the time. Yeah. That's what makes, to me, the meaning of bravery is doing something that terrifies you, but doing it anyway. Anyway, Martin Luther King. That's, oh, that's, yeah. that's courage for me. Yeah. That's faith too, mm -hmm. right? Um, which, you know, you had to have a lot of faith because, you know, one of my favorite, um, quotes from the documentary is from Morgan Freeman, who says, you know, you, ha you had to have a lot of staying power because there wasn't a whole hell of a lot for you to do. You had to create opportunities for yourself, right? People don't understand that, you know, you went on the road, you put, you put together a, a show, a road show with your daughter and your husband at the time, you know, helped backstage and she right. was on stage, which, with, which I actually got to see that show, by the way, in Los Angeles. What? Yes, I did. At Cal with my daughter? I did. I did. Disney World? Where? No, it was like in Los Angeles. I want to say it was on the was it a gay? Side. Was it a gay thing? No. No. Okay. Was, no, I can't remember what it was, but, it, but I remember seeing you and your, and your daughter together. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you did various things in order to continue to stay active. That's what happened. I'm glad you brought that up because that's what I decided to do when I suddenly, despite the Oscar and the Golden Globe, couldn't get any work. Right. So I thought I have to do something 
And uh, I decided that I would do a nightclub act. At the moment, at the time, that's what I thought, nightclub. And uh, it, boy, it helped me a great deal. Yeah. It helped me with respect to person. myself, with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, self-respect, getting paid for something, paid well. <clears throat> and uh, it saw me through some very bad times. Yeah. Um, you, but, you know, who was it? Oh, it was... Um, was the, the creator of, of Oz, his name just left my-, my Tom name. Fontana. Tom Fontana, um, who says that you credit the show for bringing you back, but, um, but he says, you know, I don't think Rita understands that she never went away. And, and I've heard that a number of times in my own career, um, you know, where people are like, what do you mean? You know, you've always been around. I'm like, well, yes, in your mind, perhaps because reruns or whatever, but, I'm, I'm struggling out here. Um, and meanwhile, you were experiencing the same thing and saw Oz as this opportunity that, you know, brought you back into the limelight. Can you talk a little bit about your work on Oz? Because that character was so far outside of what people had seen you. Seen She's a nun. She's a nun, Sister Peter Marie. And, and it happened that Tom Fontana's sister, Charlene, is a nun. Mm. And uh, she's a nun without a habit. She doesn't wear a habit. And uh, in fact, she dressed better than my nun did. And I, I, I let uh, Tom Fontana have it one day. I said, how come she dresses better than my nun? <laughs> <laughs> Why can't I dress like her? Did she work uh, in a prison too? Huh? Did she work in a prison? She did that also. Oh, okay. She did a lot of stuff, yes. And a wonderful woman. And uh, it did help me a lot. The trouble with um, um, Oz, the series, is that the lighting was very harsh in that show, deliberately. It was not meant to be soft focus at any time. And I didn't look so good in it. Hmm. I mean, if you know how I look when I'm made up, and then you see me in Oz, and you say, oh, yeah, okay. And, um, well, they, I think- But they, you know what? But you know, I'm trying to make a point. I didn't get any work from that. A lot of actors in Oz got work. Mm -hmm. I mean, Chris Maloney, B.D. Wong, J.K. Simmons, who's making a fortune, uh, right. not only in films, but in commercials. I'm the one who never got the jobs. Mm -hmm. Because I remember one time someone told me that Ray Stark, the producer, who's no, now gone, uh, was uh, asked about maybe seeing me for a move, some kind of movie he was making. And he said, oh no, God, have you seen her lately? Oh my God, this town. So when I heard that, I then uh, went to every cocktail party I was invited to in New York, <laughs> really to show people that I looked pretty right. good. Oh, it was terrible. It was really hard. It was one of those jobs that had, you know, I had two sides, one of which said, don't do this anymore. And the other that said, I'm so thrilled to be a part of this because it was an amazing show. Um, it was amazing. And, you know, I, I feel like I skipped a part, but I, this part that I wanted to talk about, which was the fact that you, you've been so honest in this, in this documentary about, um, about oh, everything. I want to go back to what, what I was trying to get to before, which was Me Too and, and the Kavanaugh hearings about why that was, um, why you were so affected by uh, the Kavanaugh hearings and, and the Me Too movement, um, because you had your own experiences that you talked yeah. about in the documentary. Um, and, you know, the fact that you went through your experiences and that you were this vocal women's rights activist, but we still had to have the Me Too movement. We still had to have George Floyd. Um, absolutely, you know, absolutely. It isn't is enough to have said, I'm, I've been there and I know it's hard and all that. That's not enough, obviously. I mean, look, it's still difficult, Yeah, right? That's my point, right? Like people are still struggling with these issues it's crazy. of crazy and misogyny, um, but your stories are really powerful and the fact that you're willing to tell them um, so, um, 
Gloria. You know, one of my favorite moments in, in the documentary, I've only seen it once. Hmm. Uh, you should see it too. When I'm, when I'm talking to young people about dignity hmm. and hanging out, and I have my baby in my hand yes. because the babysitter didn't show up. And she just screamed when she saw that. I mean, she's a woman now. Yeah. And, uh, and she said, why was I there? And I said, the babysitter didn't show up. And I had this, uh, me, I had to go there and tell people, young people, that they were worthy, that they had yes. value, that they- Well, this is my point. This is my point. This is why it was so moving because you didn't have that. You, you know, you, your, your role model was like Elizabeth Taylor because she happened to be around the same age. Right. But it was really important for you to go to events like that in front of brown and black children and say right. the things that you really needed to hear yourself. Yes, you're, you're so right. Absolutely. And really, I, uh, I credit psychotherapy for my uh, survival because uh, it really, it really helped me enormously. I was scared to death to do it. I hated it because I knew that I would have to admit to all kinds of things that I didn't want to admit to. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, that's what made me do the, um, one of the things that made me do the documentary because once I agreed to do it, um, I knew that I had to be absolutely upfront and honest. I did not want to leave things out if I was asked about certain things. I mean, I mean, I even, I even get photographed without makeup on. You think we that's see, easy for an actress? <laughs> we see you put on the famous Moreno face, as you call yes, it. The famous Moreno face. <laughs> um, I think it was, um, I think what, what shocked me the most was, if you don't mind, um, the thing that shocked me the most was the decision you made to stay with your agent after the rape, after he raped you. And that, to that, me, decision was, what, that decision was based on, <clears throat> remember I was very young. Yeah. And uh, I stayed with him because it was the only agent I could get. Right. That's all, simple that was, as that. Oh, I know. And, that and was... he pretended like it had never happened. Right. And uh, that was somewhat comforting. But uh, I saw him again in Palm Springs about four or five years ago. Wow. And you know what he told me? I didn't even mention that in, in, the, uh, in the documentary. That he was hoping he made me pregnant at the time. I just looked at him. I was speechless. You know, what did you say? I didn't say anything. That's horrifying. Was, That's horrifying. He was hoping he would trap me because of course in those days too, not even, not even abortions were available. I mean, nobody, one didn't do that. And- uh, Well, you talk about that too in the film about your own experience with that. Mm -hmm. and how terrifying that was. Yeah. You know, I, I think what's, you know, I think the reason why people need to see this movie, this documentary is because there's so much that we take for granted about um, our icons, right? About how they were able to, um, to do the transformational things that they did, like you did. Um, but we don't necessarily know the costs. Um, and we assume you that know what the cost is for and... me you know what the cost is for me i may have mentioned this i honestly don't remember everything i said in the documentary but <clears throat> i think i did mention it that there still lives in me this bratty little girl whom i call rosita which is my true name little rose and she's the one who now and then rears her little head and says Ha, 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 I mm. told you you couldn't do it. Mm. There's still that part of me that is afraid. And uh, 
and full, filled with trepidation, believe it or not. You, you the called her- you True called meaning, her. I think, of being a mature person, for me at least, is the ability for me to send Rosita to her room. <laughs> Go to your room, but she's still there. She's still there wishing me ill. Mm. I think, I have a funny feeling that I'm not alone in that, that a lot of people still have that kind of regressed, a regressed kind of uh, experience. Because there's still a part of me, obviously, that doesn't like me. And I have to send that part of me away. You know, you say something similar to that um, after Lenny dies. Um, you said that you, you send my quote, husband, quote, needy Rita, needy, needy, needy Rosita away. You sent her away. And, yeah. and I thought it was interesting that you saw her as needy, that that was the word. Oh, yes. That you chose. Like, what, what do you think she's needy for? Daddy. Mm. Daddy love. I yeah. have five fathers. And, uh. I'm sure a lot of people have had that problem too and don't react the way I do, but you know, this is how I reacted. I've, I've always looked for daddy. And uh, I mean, when you think of Marlon Brando, you think of daddy say, come on, that wasn't daddy, was it? No, it wasn't. That was a different kind of thing, but it was still take care of me. I wanted to be looked after. Right. But then you say, that Lenny, your ex, your um, now deceased husband, um, that he he was like that too. But then there came a time when you wanted to assert yourself. Well, what happens that there's that contract that you sign unwittingly right. with a partner at the beginning Here, of a here's the deal: you'll take care of me. I'll, in every way I can, be good to you. And uh, that's how we'll live happily ever after. Right, well, we assume that we're gonna be the same person in this relationship year after year after year. Exactly. And One day I wanted to start growing up. Right. That's when the marriage got into trouble. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, se the secret here, and it's not one that I have figured out myself, but it's about finding someone who you're willing to grow up with or grow through life with not necessarily someone who you're identifying as right now, you know, as yeah. right now. It's like, who is, do I want to spend, you know, some time figuring life out with this person? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, you say something about um, uh, Lydia in One Day at a Time. You say that um, she's, uh, big, she's she's so big. She's bigger. Th she's bigger than life. She's which very theatrical. Yes, which which reminded me of this um, conversation that Toni Morrison was having with Oprah Winfrey at one point, because Toni Morrison was always accused of having characters that were larger than life, and she took umbrage to that, and she said, "My characters aren't larger than life. They are as large as life." Oh, wow. <gasps> and that's what I think of with um, Lydia in One Day at a Time, that she is as large as life. She's lived this enormous life and now she's just enjoying it. Right. Um, and is that how it felt to play her? Oh, I love playing Lydia in One Day at a Time. Um, uh, the accent was my mom's. Right. Which is really quite funny. I mean, she ended up saying bad words all the time. Please. You know, like changing changing the shits on the bed and <laughs> that kind of thing. Oh, you have no idea. It was some of it was so embarrassing. <laughs> but uh Lydia, the character. Oh, I know what you'll love to hear. When I was asked to play Lydia in one day at a time. And I had Norman Lear on the phone on a conference call with uh, Brent Miller, who was his business partner and producer, and, and the, the head writer, Gloria Calderon mm -hmm. Keller. 
I said, there's one thing I really want this character to have. And I really, I said, at the cost of maybe not doing it, she must be a sexual person. Yes. And I said, just because she's old doesn't mean that she doesn't have that in her. Yes. They loved it. They said, oh my God, what a great idea. And from then on, you know, they give me some outrageous, outrageous stuff to do. I mean, flirting with, with my daughter's boyfriend, <laughs> shameless. She's absolutely shameless. I know she's shameless because in the episode that I was supposed to play your priest. Oh, oh is that where I confess to you? Yes. Oh my was, God. And there was some uh, some little flirty there. And I was like, she's even willing to go there with the, with the priest. I said, all right, Lydia, go for yours. <laughs> <laughs> That's marvelous. What a coincidence. I, that was amazing. Well, I was, a, I was a big, big fan of the show because Justina Machado is an old friend. She's, I've known Justina for years since her days on Six. Everybody knows Mas Justina Machado for years. We love her. She's she has she's lots of friends. Um, so I knew the show because of them, because you were going to be in it. And then I had, and Norman, or Mr. Lear, had helped me with um, the documentary that I was making called Visible about LGBT uh, characters on television. And, um, and so I got to meet him through there. So I was a big, big fan of the show. And um, I, I wanted, I, I just, the show meant so much to me because it was the show that we all wanted to see on television. Know, oh, yes. It was the yes. show we had always known we were capable of making. Um, okay. And it was starring the woman we loved the most who represented the moon to us. So, it was magic for all of us to watch and it's heartbreaking to think that we we won't see it again how does it how does such it feel for great you show. i really miss it and such you know what, what's what was behind it was so fabulous it was really so universal i just i can't believe we had that kind of luck but at least we made almost four seasons yeah and uh, some of the funniest scenes in the world and of course the character of lydia the uh, the mother, the or the no, the grandmother, yes. uh, is simply scrumptious. I could not wait every week to do the table reading, and see what I was up to. My character was up to. It was divine, divine. It was she's so divine. religious. She's so religious until it doesn't until it doesn't <laughs> it isn't convenient. Right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so before um, before I I. Um, Got on, the, on, got on here with you. I, I texted my mom and my aunt who are in Orlando. Yeah. Um, who love you and send their love. And they, have, they, asked, they wanted to ask you two questions if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, the first one is from my, my Titi. Right. And she's also my godmother, uh, Lydia. Uh -huh. um, and she wants to know what the secret of staying young is. It's so much a frame of mind. It also helps to have good genes too. I do have unusually good genes. I'm, I'm 89. Which is unreal. I'm, I, the way I usually say it, I'm 89, coño. Coño, estoy 89. <laughs> okay, what's the answer to the uh, other? I mean, the mother, question. Well, I think we talked about this. My mother said, was it hard to go on stage, to, to get on stage because you were Latina at the time? We talked The about answer that. is yes. Yes. And oh. she wanted to know if you ever got hit with la chancla. <laughs> no, but I got hit with a belt. Yes. A belt, la chancla. We got threatened with the belt. My dad would come out and show oh, it yeah. to and Like this, right? right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Cuidado. Se, siéntate ahí. <laughs> we, I have to go because I yes. have other things We're to do. Done. I was life. just going to say thank you. Hey, what a pleasure. The pleasure was mine. And you sure did your homework. Bless your heart. You, you this was good. I enjoyed it. Oh, I'm glad. I loved I loved the documentary. I really did. I can't wait for people to see it. Thank you. And we love you. And thank you for everything. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.